Okay, so good evening and welcome to the third day of 32nd Pediatric International Congress held by Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I'm Dr. Maryam Bakhtiari. I'm a third year pediatric resident here in Children's Medical Center, Tehran University as well, and I'm more than honored to be here with you guys and to host this meeting. So the session that we're going to talk about today is the second uh, session of the series of ICU panels that we have prepared in this Congress. And uh, we, are having, uh, we have uh, some distinguished guests and lecturers. We have Dr. Mohseni, we have Professor Cox, and also Dr. Sayli, who have joined us. And we are more than honored to have them with us. And thank you for joining us again. So a few points and, uh, and keynotes to have in mind. So uh, please make sure to mute your microphone during this webinar to not interrupt the lecturer's voice. And you can use the chat section below to write your questions or your insights or uh, whatever you wanna share with us. And we will read them in the proper time, maybe after each lecturer's time, uh, after each lecturer's speech, or maybe in the end. We will see how we will go. Okay, so uh, we're going to start this meeting with Dr. Cox. Thank you, Dr. Cox, for joining us again. I'm seeing you're joining us from space. It looks like you're joining us from space. <laughs> yeah, just uh, trying to get out of the mess in North America. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so some introduction for everyone. I'm sure everyone knows you, but just a brief introduction. So Professor Peter Cox is Professor Emeritus of Anesthesia, Pediatric and Critical Care at the University of Toronto. For many years, he was the Fellowship Program Director for the Critical Care Program at SickKids Hospital. The program has now trained nearly 500 fellows from close to 50 countries. He was also Chief of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit there. Dr. Cox is also an avid cyclist, which is really interesting. And last year completed a charity bike ride of 200,000 kilometers from Cairo to Cape Town. And I was amazed from hearing- Not 200,000. <laughs> Like 12,000 kilometers. 12,000. Okay. Yes. Oh, my God. $200,000. No, that was an impossible number. Sorry about that. But it was really impressive. The kilometers was really impressive, and it was actually for a really good cause, for the cause of treatment of children with cleft palate in poor countries. And after his retirement, he has been active in clinical and teaching missions in Kenya, Malawi, Thailand, and Lebanon. So Dr. Cox, we're more than honored to have you with us. Thank you for joining us and sharing your time and expertise. And we are ready for you whenever you are. So do I just go to share screen? Yes, I will make you a co-host now and you can share your screen right now. Yes, okay, so you can share your screen now, I think. Yes, we can see them now. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. We're good to go. Okay. So um, I've been um, asked to talk a little bit about respiratory mechanics and pulmonary physiology. And I, I think, um, firstly, I must say that doing lectures in this format is a completely uh, new test for me. I'm used to speaking to people and looking them in the eye. Um, I also... Um, very disappointed that I'm not able to visit your beautiful country and to actually share some time and learn a little bit more. I um, feel so ignorant about so many different parts of the world. So hopefully in a better future that will happen. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in and talk about pulmonary physiology and respiratory mechanics. And I think it is always a value to start with um, some clinical grounding. So I'm gonna give you an example of a three month old previously well child he was admitted to a community hospital with what looked like bronchiolitis the child deteriorated quite rapidly and was transferred to the hospital for sick children here in toronto we act as a central hub for pediatric intensive care and you can see that the child is now being intubated has got a nasogastric tube in sight and you can see that the kid has quite diffuse bilateral a lung disease. Um, the child on examination was febrile, mottled, and we resuscitated him quite aggressively. Um, so aggressively, in fact, that he developed pulmonary edema um, and bilateral pleural effusions. His hypoxia became a more profound, and we commenced uh, with high frequency oscillatory ventilation. 
um, after which he developed a pneumothorax because of poor compliance. And you can see this is the next, next x-ray and a right-sided chest tube has already been placed. You can also see that the lung disease has progressed quite significantly. The child was edematous, had a temperature of 39, and required 100% oxygen, and there were no signs of meningococcuria uh, or uh, pneumococcus, and um, there were also no nail and skin findings. The lab findings to date, the child was RSV negative, influenza A negative, a throat swab was positive for group A strep, and that was at the referring hospital. But in our institution, uh, we did get moderate um, gram-positive cocci, and a culture of those was still pending. We treated the child with um, penicillin. Yes, we do still use penicillin in Canada. Um, clindamycin. We chose not to use vancomycin, but did use ceftriaxone. And given how sick the child was, we started intravenous gamma globulin. And you can see in this film that there are now bilateral uh, chest tubes. There's one on the left and one on the right. The pneumothorax is reaccumulated and the chest wall has become quite significantly thickened. Endotracheal tubes in place. This is a thermometer probe and the nasogastric um, line going into the abdomen. Given the fact that the child continued to um, deteriorate, we made uh, an elective choice to place the child on ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This was an unusual practice for us as we did not, at the time that we did this, we did not routinely use ECMO for this kind of lung disease. However, we thought it was worth the chance. Um, the child required repeated bronchoscopies because the airways were plugged with um, hemopurulent material and it was almost impossible to move any air. We did grow a staph aureus from blood uh, bronchial lavage and the arterial line. Given that there was no improvement um, after three weeks of ECMO, um, you can see in the x-ray, um, these are the ECMO cannula, um, the venous cannula going into the heart, the arterial cannula going into the arch of the aorta. You can see many other lines, which are thermistor probes, bilateral chest tubes. There's another chest tube down here. Um, but lungs that have absolutely no air in them. And this is not uncommon after a period of time on ECMO as this child was. So as I said, after the three weeks with severe tracheal erosions, membrane formation, we advised the parents that there was no value in continuing with a mechanical support and took the child off ECMO. Um, as is our practice, um, we requested a post-mortem and the pictures, I think, are important for you to see because what they illustrate is lungs that have got a lot of hemorrhagic damage, but there's no airspace. And the airspace has completely disappeared. And even though we use what are called rest settings on ECMO, you can see that there's nothing to ventilate. This is a specimen that has already been fixed and there's an empyema in the middle. And if we look at the next specimen, you can see that there's diffuse gram-positive staphylococci, which was the cause of this child's infection. The pathology from those gram-positive cocci had caused bronchiolitis, as you can see in this image, and bronchiectasis, as you can see in this image. So I use this as a background to demonstrate a child who was previously quite well, going through the full gamut of um, respiratory infection, pneumonia, ending up with death. And it's always a good way to think of why I went to work every day. Now, I'm very interested in respiratory physiology and I believe that the only reason intensive care doctors go to work is to make sure that molecules of oxygen are delivered to the cells. A cardiac um, physician or um, a nephrologist might have a slightly different uh, opinion. So. What we do is we focus on this molecule of oxygen coming from ambient air into the lungs where there's ventilation, diffusing across the alveolar capillary membrane into the circulation, and then being distributed through the body to the mitochondria. 
And I want you to notice, in, this is in millimeters of mercury on the right hand side, that in the atmosphere, um, oxygen is 140 millimeters of mer mercury at sea level. And down at the alveoli, it's somewhere between zero and 10, depending on exactly where you are. So there's a big fall off over that delivery system. And you can see that there are many points along the way that are at risk. If we start with ventilation, clearly the first thing we want to do with every breath that we take is to make sure that we align the ventilation, i.e. the tidal volume of breath, with alveoli that are very well perfused. And in this diagram, which comes from West, um, I've got three balls, and the central ball um, depicts ventilation, VA, over perfusion, Q dot, and it shows you that they are equal. And clearly that is ideal. We're now optimizing the ventilation with the perfusion. There are circumstances where the airway gets blocked, and this is on your left-hand image. You can see the airway here is blocked as some form of obstruction, so that my ventilation becomes decreased to a level of one. My perfusion will be the same, because there's no change in it. And this is what we would, in its extreme form, call a shunt. On the other hand, if you look at the ball on the right-hand side, you can see that my ventilation is quite wide open, and so that gets a value of 10, but my perfusion is blocked. And so this is what we'd call dead space. There's ventilation and no perfusion. So that's in its very simplest terms. If you take a step back from that and look at this image, which shows more or less what the structure is of the airway itself, coming into a lung via bronchi, secondary bronchi, bronchioles, and then all the way down to alveoli, which have um, arterial and venous blood, um, and that is where gas exchange takes place. Very complex system, but just about everything up until this point can be called dead space, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. How do we drive air in and out? Essentially, we use a pump, and our pump consists of this, which is our chest wall ribs, muscles, and diaphragm. And on your left-hand side are the muscles of inspiration. And we have principal and secondary muscles, but the principal muscles are the ones I want you to focus on, which are the ex external intercostals, the parasternals, and very importantly, the diaphragm, which is not that well depicted, but this line over here. Oops. So during inspiration, the ribs are lifted up like a bucket handle by contraction of the external intercostals muscles. Sorry, there's somebody speaking if they could mute their mic. Thank you. Um, the external intercostal muscles pull the ribs up like a bucket handle, increasing the volume inside the chest. And by doing this creates a negative pressure relative to the atmosphere and suck air in. On the other hand, during expiration, and I'm now gonna take you to the column on the right-hand side, we know that at the end of a deep inspiration, you just relax, and by passive breathing, there's recoil of the elasticity of the lungs, which allows gas, now under positive pressure, to be forced out into the atmosphere. Because remember that gas is a fluid, and it'll always flow down a pressure gradient. This picture is a little bit more simple, but it explains what I've just said, that in inspiration, the rib cage expands, the diaphragm moves downwards, the volume of the chest gets bigger, the pressure inside the chest gets negative, and air goes into your trachea and down into your lungs. During expiration, on the other hand, normally by elastic recoil, the ribs, again, like a bucket handle, will come down, the diaphragm will move upwards, and that will decrease the volume in the chest, thereby increasing the pressure of the gas inside the chest, and therefore allowing air to be exhaled. 
This is a diagram that I think you're all familiar with from your medical school days, but just to remind you, this is spirometry, and if we start off with a patient or an individual, a subject who's breathing in and out and in and out, and then takes a big breath in and a big breath out, and then goes back to normal breathing. So these small breaths are what is called tidal volume. When I take a big breath in, that is called my inspiratory reserve volume. And when I give my big breath out, that's called my expiratory reserve volume. You can see those are fairly well titled here. At the end of my breath out, the gas that's left inside my chest is residual volume. And if I take the end of a normal tidal volume breath and I add that to residual volume, I get what's called functional residual capacity. And that's a very important concept to understand as we deal with patients getting sick, requiring mechanical ventilation. There are other things on the screen that you can see. Inspiratory capacity is how much I can breathe in. My vital capacity is my total inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume. So it's all the breathing that I can do, which will still leave me with residual volume. And clearly all of this fits within the total lung capacity. This just gives you a slightly different picture, which I added this morning, because I was trying to think of things that impact on um, us our chest volumes, just as we're sitting here. And I mentioned earlier on that the chest wall has some elasticity. There's an element of elastic recoil, which makes the chest want to bounce out. There's thoracic recoil of the chest, which makes the chest want to bounce outwards. And the lung, as you all know, if you've ever treated a pneumothorax, wants to collapse oh, yeah, inward. Yeah. It's the balance of the forces between the outward recoil of the chest and the inward recoil of the lung that give us this diagram. Here I have two images. The one on the right is an adult and the one on the left is an infant. And you can see that the blue line on both of them, which is the lung elastic recoil, is exactly the same. It comes from your top right hand corner and gets down towards zero. So this line is the same. What's important though, is that in an infant, on your left hand side, compared to an adult, the chest wall elasticity is much less. And you'll remember that where the chest wall pulling out and the lung pulling in are at rest with each other is called FRC. And from this diagram, you can see that the FRC of a child is much less than the FRC of an adult. And again, a very important concept for those of us working with children to understand is that their functional residual capacity is less. Why is that important? Because that you can look at as spare volume in your lung that you can fill with oxygen uh, to allow for improved gas exchange. This is going back to the same diagram that I had up before looking at spirometry. Um, just to illustrate with these two red arrows, the FRC in infants being significantly less than the FRC in, a, in an adult. Equally, closing volume I've added to this picture, and that's when alveoli begin to close. In an infant, the normal ventilation actually impinges on closing volume so that some alveoli close at the end of a normal breath. This is all important as it speaks to the amount of reserve capacity that you have in a child's lungs. Enough about that aspect of the volume. The other important thing that we want to focus on, once we've actually got air through the airway into the alveolus, what happens when it gets there? We know just at first principle, that oxygen goes into the blood and carbon dioxide comes out. And that is governed by Fick's law of diffusion. And I put this up to illustrate the very important factors that govern it. Um, lungs aren't normally shaped like a rectangle, but it's the best way to understand it. And the fact is that 
govern the movement of, for example, oxygen across the alveolar capillary membrane. So think of the alveolus on this side and the blood on this side are number one, the pressure gradient, P1 to P2 across that membrane. Number two, and very, very important with oxygen, is the area that it is exposed to because surface area is an important part of this equation. And then number three, this membrane's thickness. Clearly, if the membrane is thicker or thicker and thicker, it'll be more and more difficult to move gas across it. So the equation for the movement of gas across this membrane is proportional to the surface area, which is this, inversely proportional to the thickness, because the thicker this is, the slower it is. The greater A is, the greater it is. The diffusion coefficient, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then the pressure gradient. The diffusion coefficient has to do with the solubility of the gas over its molecular weight. And I put carbon dioxide next to oxygen because carbon dioxide is much more soluble so its movement across this membrane will be governed to a large extent by solubility as well as the other factors I've mentioned up here. So to recap, the movement of gas across the membrane is directly proportional to the surface area, inversely proportional to the thickness. If this gets more, movement of gas gets less. Proportional to the diffusion coefficient and solubility is an important factor and also directly proportional to the pressure gradient across that membrane. This is an image of, a, of an infant taken from a book, basically looking at this infant up here with his airway and his lungs. And what I'm trying to illustrate is that in normal alveoli, you've got a really nice big surface area for oxygen exchange. Whereas if those alveoli collapsed, the surface area is dramatically reduced. And these photomicrographs above here, can, in, in this you can see that the white areas are areas of the lung that are open, they normal alveoli, versus this bottom image which is showing alveoli that are collapsed and not able to be effective and efficient in the gas exchange. This is a very old image from 1964 and it's been used in many, many physiology lectures over time, which I think speaks to its importance. Just to explain to you what we're looking at, in the bottom part of this diagram is something called a pressure volume curve. By convention, pressure is on the horizontal axis and volume is on the vertical axis. And if you take a lung, and you blow air into it. This is a lung that's isolated in the laboratory and you blow air into it. You can blow up to a certain pressure, up to four, up to six, up to eight, and then suddenly the lung will begin to open. And as you increase the pressure, the lung will open more and more until it is open at its total lung capacity. That's illustrated in this top diagram here where you have a lung that's getting pressure, more pressure, more pressure, and slowly the lung begins to open and then inflates until it is at its total lung capacity. Now, if I start letting that gas out of the lung, so now I'm gonna go down this curve, I will decrease my pressure from 20 to 18 to 16, 20 to 18 to 16, and you can see that the volume is going to decrease. What's important though is that the decrease in volume with the same amount of pressure is very different. So for example at a pressure of 8 my volume in this lung is about 25 or 30 as I'm trying to inflate it. However when I'm deflating it my volume is five times that amount. Now, if you go back and you think about the previous comments I made about the movement of oxygen across the membrane and how important surface area is, it is obvious that when you're ventilating this lung, you want to have the lung inflated, as you can see in these images, rather than deflated, as you can see here.
does this actually work in reality? And the answer is yes, this is something we did in our laboratory. Again, a pressure volume curve on the um, horizontal axis, I've got mean airway pressure in the bottom left-hand corner. But instead of uh, volume on the vertical axis, I've now got PaO2, in other words, oxygenation. So what I want you to know is that as I inflate this lung by pushing volumes of air into it, the lung gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as I do that, I increase the surface area and you can see very nicely illustrated that the oxygenation in the, this is in a rabbit actually, the oxygenation in the rabbit's blood increases dramatically. I use this as an illustration for the really, really important um, aspect that lung surface area plays in gas exchange. So that's enough about oxygen for the minute. Oops. What we're going to do now is the other important thing that a lung does is to um, get rid of CO2. Um, CO2, as we know, is a byproduct of metabolism and we need to get it out of our system. And what I've got here is the arterial value of CO2 and what it is inversely proportional to is tidal volume and frequency. Now we all know that if we hyperventilate, <laughs> what happens is that we blow off CO2, ultimately to the point where we become very hypercarbic, can affect your calcium and various other things and you can run into all sorts of problems. The factors that I've got up here, PaCO2, is proportional to one over VT times F. And VT is your tidal volume. So remember from the spirometry I showed you earlier, every breath is a tidal volume. And frequency, F, is the number of times you do that within every minute. So what you have is your minute ventilation, VT times F. However, it's important when you think about VT to recognize that VT or the tidal volume is not all involved in gas exchange. Remember we mentioned that gas has to get into the alveoli, that's VA, alveolar ventilation, or alveolar volume. But the other part of the breath that you breathe in is dead space volume. So this is what is really important. If this becomes most of what you're breathing, then your um, alveolar ventilation becomes very ineffective and your carbon dioxide will increase. Again, going back, this is just a, an illustration to try and show you that as I take in a VT, a tidal volume breath, it's divided into VD, which is my anatomic dead space. And in this little diagram on the top right hand corner, that would involve all of my major airways because there's no gas exchanging mechanism in these airways. Gas has to reach here. So the gas that reaches alveoli that are functional or perfused and ventilated, that is my VA. So that's effective alve alveolar ventilation. We do know from before, because I showed you this in an earlier picture, that some of the alveoli may be ventilated, but not perfused. So this is anatomical dead space. The ventilated and not perfused alveoli are called physiological dead space. So it's important to understand the concepts of every time you take a breath in. So if you think of the causes of a high PaCO2, we can increase production, that is when we are hypermetabolic, but decreased excretion is really what happens in um, most of the time in an ICU, and that's either because our frequency of ventilation is decreased or because our volumes of alveolar ventilation are decreased. So either of those will lead to an increased CO2. So when you're ventilating a patient like this, the important factors that you really need to focus on is to optimize the surface area, and that will optimize your oxygen gas exchange, and to optimize effective alveolar ventilation to be able to get rid of your CO2. Let's move on to what actually happens in an ICU. 
I've already touched on the fact that in order for us to take a breath, we create a negative pressure inside our chest, and that allows um, gas to flow from the atmosphere into our lungs, and that's in spontaneous ventilation. Now, as soon as we put this patient on a mechanical breathing machine, we change that whole dynamic by forcing gas into the trachea, therefore into the lungs, and we're changing exactly what is going to happen to that patient. So we're applying a positive pressure that you dial into your machine, depending on the patient's compliance, and that has the potential to cause quite significant damage. And we've learned over the years that the damage can be divided primarily into three components. The one is barrow trauma, and barrow is pressure. So if you use too much pressure, you can get the equivalent of a blowout or a puncture, and you'll get gas leaking from your lungs into your pleural space, a pneumothorax. More recently, we've learned and understood the concept of stretch injury. This is more recently in my career, which is in the last 20, 25 years in ICU. Um, we recognize that there's something called stretch injury, and that is without actually causing an air leak, just repeated stretching of these alveoli causes quite significant damage to the alveolus itself, as well as releasing a lot of cytokines which cause chemotrauma. And that's been very well established over time. So these are all negative effects of using a mechanical ventilator and how we use a ventilator, and I think you'll be getting a lecture on that later on, is extremely important. Just a little bit about ventilation. When we think about now taking gas that's in a machine and driving it with a pump into a patient's lungs, what are we actually doing? In the top left-hand corner, I've got basically a straight tube, which has got a flow of gas and a pressure gradient, P1 and P2. And you know that if you blow through a straw, the amount of flow that's going to go through here is going to depend on the amount of pressure that you apply, the resistance, which I'm not going to get into, and the pressure below it. So this is more or less a straight line. As flow increases, as the pressure gradient increases, the flow increases, and they're directly correlated. On the other hand, if you look at an alveolus, which is what I've tried to depict with this not very good drawing of mine, um, we can have a pressure gradient, P1 and P2, but rather than this being a straight line, as the ball expands, it reaches a limit and the volume of the ball becomes fixed. So it's an exponential and flow will actually decrease. Let's have a look at it in a lung image. This again is from West. This is an image of a lung. Um, at balance, the P is zero and zero, and because of the elastic recoil of the lung, the intrapleural pressure is minus five. If I get an air leak and I make that intrapleural pressure zero, then my lung is actually going to collapse, as you can see in this picture. And what that does, to go back to earlier information I showed you, is again, he has the elasticity of the chest wall, which reflects this. Here's the elasticity of the lung, this line down here, which reflects this. And the balance between the two, when they are perfectly in balance, is what gives me FRC. So this is when they go out of balance. My pressure in my lung and pressure in my intrapleural space are now going to be balanced up by the elastic recoils in either direction. Just a quick comment on alveolar size and lungs, which are either fully inflated or of small lung volume. This is, there's often collapse in the lower part. So first of all, let's look at the normal situation on your left-hand side. The lung is fully inflated and there's a negative pressure of about minus 10 at the apex of your lung and a negative pressure of about minus 2.5 at the base of your lung. So if you put this on a graph, Here's intrapleural pressure. This is minus 2.5, which is an alveolus from here. 
and this is minus 10, which is now the other shot here. And as I add um, inflation to this lung, you can see that the volume, by adding the same amount of pressure, these alveoli increase much more in, vo in volume than alveoli at the apex of the lung. An important concept to consider because remember by gravity, more of your perfusion is going to this part of the lung. If I have a lung that's got small lung volume, and this is in the diagram on the right hand side, and some of these alveoli are actually in a collapsed part of the lung, so the pressure is positive 3.5, there's no gas inside it. Whereas in the apex of the lung, there is a negative pressure, but it's somewhat less than what it was in the diagram on your left. So if I take this lung and I apply the same amount of pressure that I did in a normal lung, you will see that the alveoli at the base don't increase in volume. Whereas the alveoli at the apex now increase much more. And again, when you look at an x-ray of a patient and you see that there's collapse down at the base of the lung, if you want to get this lung ventilated properly, you need to be able to start off with a lung, an alveolus that's inflated. And that is why we use PEEP. And again, I'm not going to get into PEEP in this lecture, but that's to give you an idea of what PEEP is used for. Just to mention very briefly the concept of compliance, because we've all heard of compliant and non-compliant lungs. And really, when you want to think about that is that if you imagine, I think my next picture shows that, if I take a balloon and I fill it with water, I can fill that balloon very quickly with a large volume of water because the water will stretch the balloon outward. And so you can call this very good compliance. This is the same pressure volume curve I illustrated earlier on. Um, and this is taking the same lung, but rather than using saline or water, I'm using gas. And so the compliance when you use gas compared to water is actually quite different. What I'm talking about is a lung that is stiff or not so stiff. And the examples that you can use here is a lung that's got really good compliance is a lung that's lost a lot of its structure. Someone has COPD in an adult, we don't see that much in children. Or a lung that's become very stiff is somebody who has fibrosis. You have to pump a high amount of pressure into that lung to get even a small amount of volume in. So the concept of compliance is the stiffness of the lung or the amount of pressure that you need to use to get a volume of gas into the lung itself. Importantly though, when you look at compliance is that we're looking just at a number, but the pathology that you're dealing with can be completely different. And these two chest CTs show on the left hand side a diffuse aspergillus um, disease that's been resolving versus a nosocomial pneumonia. And you can see that the lung volumes you're actually dealing with are quite different. Equally, um, this is a series of CT chests taken over time um, in a patient with ARDS. And what's important to note is that, again, pressure and volume is that the compliance of this lung at the beginning of the disease is much better than the compliance in this lung as the disease progresses. And the illustration in the bottom of these just straight lines shows you that as lung disease gets worse, during the progress of um, or evolution of a disease, that compliance usually gets worse before it will get better. This again is a, is a very old um, illustration, and um, two of them, one from uh, Suter on the left hand side in 1968, and the other one from Thomas in 1984. But what I want you to take away from this is that we mentioned before that finding the optimal compliance, if you go back to some of the diagrams I've shown you, or the use of um, in being able to inflate a lung, by finding the optimal compliance using PEEP, you can see that shunt, which is the solid black line, decreases, and oxygenation dramatically increases. And that's the point where here, the compliance has gone from this level up to this level. So ideally you want to find a point on a lung 
where you're able to ventilate at the best compliance possible. This is data from a guy called Marcelo Armado, and the reason that I'm putting it up is, is only to illustrate, and there's a lot of debate about this diagram itself, but what he used was two strategies, and one of them was using a higher PEEP, so he's using a better compliant lung than the conventional uh, ventilation that was used at that time, and this is done in the mid-90s, um, but the survival of these patients was somewhat better. There's a lot of debate about it, but just to make an illustration that using a strategy where you optimize compliance and surface area of your lung leads to better patient outcomes. Again, trying to illustrate lung volume. This is a series of CTs done again by Gattinoni, and you can see very nicely the lung volume in the bottom left-hand picture compared to the lung volume in the top right-hand picture, how by increasing the pressure, you get what is the same as my pressure volume curve from before, right up to the point where the lung is nicely inflated and you're now able to optimize ventilation. And remember that when you deflate this lung, the curve's gonna be different, it's gonna be over here, and that will allow for optimal ventilation. I've tried to animate it in this diagram by saying, that as I inflate, if you watch this little ball, I'll inflate the lung up to the point where the lung is nicely wide open. And then I will deflate the lung to the point where I begin to lose lung volume. But notice that the pressure that I had to get this volume on inflation is now giving me this volume on deflation. So there's a nice big difference between the two in volume. And remember that volume equates to surface area. So I want to try and ventilate my patient with the optimal lung volume, not using too high a pressure so I don't get barotrauma, giving me the best possible gas exchange that I can get. These are two experiments I'm gonna show you, but just how important it is. Yeah, I've got PaO2, but it's also lung volume. You can see that PaO2, of about 400 in a lung that is nicely inflated, in this case using HFO, versus a lung that is not inflated because we haven't used the same strategy. Again, showing you exactly the same thing, volume above FRC using an inflated model versus a non-inflated model. These are experiments that we did um, to try and demonstrate what kind of lung volumes um, we should be using and how we are able to achieve them. In this last um, couple of pictures, this is just taken in some, oops. This is a, a, a CT taken to demonstrate that a lot of the disease in the lung can be very posterior. And again, it reflects an understanding of um, mechanics um, that Abdominal weight, abdominal contents weight on the diaphragm presses and compresses the lung as well as the weight of the heart. And by turning this patient over onto their uh, belly, in other words, prone ventilation, the mechanically you've given them an advantage by allowing the abdominal contents to fall away from the lung and the heart weight to fall off the lung. So the lung is now nicely inflated. Does this work in little babies? And um, this is some work that we did in premature neonates um, using an MRI scanner. Um, we put them prone, supine and then prone, and we're able to demonstrate again very nicely that the um, lung volumes when they were prone were much better maintained than when they were supine. So common things that we can do. And I won't get into the details of that because it becomes too complex. So what I'll leave you with um, an understanding, hopefully of a little bit of a refresher of pulmonary physiology um, and some respiratory mechanics, which will put you in a position where you are better able to ventilate the kids that you have the privilege of caring for as you move forward in your careers. And with that, I thank you very much. Those are your goals of ventilation. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Cox. Thank you, Professor, for 
this amazing lecture for sharing the respiratory physiology and also this amazing uh, information. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. So, just uh, yes, Dr. Karib has a question right now. Thanks a lot, Professor uh, Cox, for your nice presentation. Uh, so. I think that you also were talking about the importance of uh, PEEP for reducing the thickness and extending the area and also increasing the functional residual capacity. So uh, mainly in mechanical ventilation, uh, it was the effect, the positive effects of PEEP. We were always thinking uh, <clears throat> at what extent PEEP may help us. However, you were not talking about uh, cardiopulmonary interactions, but at what extent PIP may help us in reducing the thickness, um, extending the area, and increasing the functional residual capacity in comparing with uh, its uh, negative effects on ven venous return. Can, uh, for example, in a neonate without cardiac problem or cardiac failure, can be in uh, problems like uh, severe pneumonia. How we can uh, um, estimate that uh, at what extent we may increase the PEEP for improving oxygenation, functional FRC, or uh, reducing the thickness, increasing the area. Is there a somehow practical measure for those who are working uh, at the clinics near the patient? Thank oh, you. yes, most, most certainly there is. And, and I think the, the most important aspect is that um, it involves the clinician or the caregiver being at the bedside. There, isn't, there is not a formula because um, in a lung that is very non-compliant, in other words, a lung that's very stiff, the amount of pressure that is transmitted to the cardiopulmonary circulation is actually minimal. Whereas in a very compliant lung, if I took your lungs, I'm sure they're healthy, and I inflated them with air, I could decrease your venous return pretty, pretty dramatically. Okay, so, so the only way to answer your question is to stand at the bedside and use um, a number of strategies to slowly increase your PEEP until you get improved oxygenation. But at the same time, you are watching what it is doing to your venous return and cardiac output. Because everything we do is dynamic. Um, one of the nice things about working in a laboratory with rabbits is that every rabbit is exactly the same. I've given them all exactly the same disease and I can apply standard increments. All right. When you work in a neonatal intensive care unit, every baby is different. So you can't apply standards to every one of them. What you can apply is a principle. And, and I think uh, neonatologists in particular are often uh, cautious in using PEEP because of the fear of its impact on cardiopulmonary interactions and because of the fear of barotrauma. Interestingly, those little lungs are actually quite strong. And I think what's more important is to ensure that you've got adequate oxygenation to the brain and other organs in the body. And the only way to do this is by ensuring that you have optimized, I didn't say maximize, I said optimized surface area for gas exchange and ventilation without compromising cardiac output. And sometimes you need to augment cardiac output either by the administration of fluids or by the use of an inotrope. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So thanks again, Dr. Professor Cox, for uh, your amazing lecture. Thank you, Dr. Akarib. And we really hope to see you in Iran in COVID-free days. We really, we will hope to see you in person or maybe we see you in Canada. Either way, <laughs> we will really be honored to see you there. And uh, we have another session with you. Uh, tomorrow. tomorrow yes so tomorrow so we will be back with you tomorrow and hopefully we will see you then again um so, yes. would you 
would you like me to stay for more questions and answers or is are there any more questions now uh, i don't see any more questions right now but if you could stay if you could stay maybe so people might write questions in the chat sure. section if, if it's possible for you it would be perfect actually okay thank you so my much. pleasure thank okay you. thank you Okay, so next we're going to uh, Dr. Mohseni. Dr. Mohseni, are you still with us? Can yes, yes, me? yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. okay, so let me give you an introduction again. So we were with you another, uh, yesterday as well, actually two days ago, but uh, just a brief introduction about Dr. Mohseni, our dear Dr. Mohseni. So you are from Khorasan. Actually, I'm originated from Khorasan, so I feel really proud right now. And uh, you were trained in medicine uh, uh, at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. He then continued to train in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, and pediatric critical care and tropical medicine in the States, England, and Canada. Dr. Mohseni was on the teaching staff at the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto until 2015 when he started working with humanitarian missions in Sub-Saharan Africa. He has worked in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Central America. Currently, he is an honorary staff at the PICU of the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto, and also works with the Doctors Without Borders and Canadian Red Cross. So, Dr. Mohseni, with this introduction, we will really hope and we really are honored to have you. Thank you for joining us again today and we are ready whenever you are. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know what happened to my presentation. Let's see. Um, because I was able to share it with you a minute yes, ago. Yeah, we checked it. Yeah, we checked it actually. Yeah, so I, I just uh, have to see. Uh, please open, open your PowerPoint. And yeah, it was. No, I checked it, uh, Dr. Bakhtari, a minute ago. Let's just see if I can. I had a bit of this problem yesterday too, so it exactly. took a while. It took a while. I don't know what the problem uh, is. We are in no rush, but if you want, uh -huh. you can go to Dr. Sally, or we could wait, whatever, which one you would prefer. Um, so just a um, second, see if... Yes, yes, we will wait. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. Okay, so thank you very much again for your introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you about perioperative care of the congenital diaphragmatic hernia or CDH. It's almost impertinent that I speak about this in the presence of, uh, of Dr. Cox because he has a lot more experience with it than I do, but if he's there, he can then correct me if I say things that he doesn't like. So what I am going to talk to you about today briefly in the next 25, 30 minutes, are one, what are the main problems in CDH? We touch upon physiology and management of pulmonary hypertension, cardiac dysfunction, and long protective ventilatory strategies. We talk a little bit about the evolution of CDH care over the last four decades, uh, about sick kids' praxis, predictors of outcome, and what is new. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Mm, a lot of what I know about CDH I learned from uh, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Bone, who uh, is retired now. And some of, a few of these uh, slides are from him and a few of them are from Dr. Lally in Houston. Uh, so the problem with CDH uh, is that it is a lung and cardiopulmonary problem. Um, it's not just that you have a hole in the diaphragm and something has gone up into the chest and has caused a physical problem. Uh, you have a smaller lungs, you have a smaller pulmonary vascular bed, and you have an abnormal response to pulmonary vasoactive or vasodilator substances. And it's not just in the ipsilateral or the involved side, it's on the other side too. So um, these are just a list of problems that you will have in the lungs. Most important of which is that you not only have reduced number and uh, mass of the vessels, but they also respond inappropriately and poorly to vasodilators. And that's the main cause of the pulmonary hypertension. 
uh, and also your lung growth in utero has not been uh, normal. You have a smaller uh, number and um, size of the alveoli and abnormal diffusion capacity. The other side of this equation is the heart problem. So lung does not live in the chest on its own. There is also heart in there, both of them in the thorax, and they have to get the air and blood between themselves. So uh, there is an increased incidence of congenital heart disease, you know, and that's the most lethal congenital anomaly that you can have at CDH. But apart from that, there's a physical effect of uh, abdominal contents in the chest which might impede the growth of the left side of the heart. Uh, the other thing is that though we all learned uh, you know, fetal cardiovascular physiology from Rudolf experiments in the sheep, uh, in, uh, in the sheep, the only 10% of the blood flow in utero goes to the lungs and less than 10%. So pulmonary venous return does not have a big role in development of the left side of the heart. But in human fetuses, about 20% of blood flow goes to the lungs in utero. So when you have reduction of the pulmonary venous return, that also contributes to a smaller size of the LA and LV. Uh, other uh, cardiovascular problem is the ductal and intracardiac shunt uh, and right heart dysfunction and failure. So this is a general scheme of the cardiac dysfunction. As you can see in utero, uh, they have very high PVR uh, uh, and also they have a low systemic vascular resistance because placenta is a very low vascular resistance circuit. So not a lot of blood flow goes to the lungs. But as we talked about, there are reasons, both physical and venous return related, the LV might not grow as well. When the child is born, suddenly, uh, pulmonary uh, systemic vascular resistance goes up and the pulmonary vascular resistance is supposed to drop but in these children it doesn't drop as much. The left ventricle might have problems from the beginning, from the get-go and it's usually both systolic and diastolic problems because of the reduced LV output, systemic hypertension and acidosis. When the child is born we, by clamping the umbilical cord we, put, we increase the afterload of the LV. Uh, and also because in utero, a lot of preload of the LV comes from venous blood in the right side, because as you know, a lot of this blood goes through the uh, PFO towards the left side. So the LV is deprived of its preload and is now facing an increased afterload. So that's the reason the LV actually is the first chamber of the heart that has problems, not the RV. RV uh, dysfunction increases throughout the first week and RV is both diastolic and systolic problem. As the RV gets into more problem, then the septum bulges into the left and causes problem with the left side. So how do we assess the RV function and the pulmonary artery hypertension at the bedside? These are all, you know, it's, these are all, you know, not, these are echocardiographic methods. I, I'm not talking about the clinical or blood gas evidence of it, uh, but the ones that I have highlighted in red are the ones that we use at the bedside and the other ones are usually the ones that the cardiologist does and puts it on the report, but, but we look mainly at the first four. The first echocardiography that we do, we do a complete one because as I said, the most common lethal anomaly in these children is congenital heart disease. So they have to rule that out and also they look at every uh, physiological parameter. So. Uh, just in brief to issue the picture, this is how to get your TR to the uh, pulmonary uh, and the right ventricular pressure by looking at that. Uh, also, you look at the septum. Uh, as you can see here with a flat septum, it means that the RV you know, pressure at end systole is, is more than half systemic. And there's a, an index called left ventricular eccentricity index that you can get it from there. But we usually you just look at the shape of the septum and where it is bulging towards. Uh, you look at the ductus and the direction of shunt. If you have bidirectional shunt across your ductus, it means that the pressure in the RV is close to systemic or systemic. Um, and also you can look at the velocity of the shunt. Here it's on the unilateral. You look at the velocity of the shunt because if the velocity goes up, then it tells you that the PDA is becoming restrictive and we talk about it later, what is the importance of that. Uh, these other indices that we don't look a lot in the ICU at, but it's mainly the domain of cardiologists, the pulmonary artery acceleration time and RV ejection time, that you may it's a parastermal short. 
and also the myocardial performance index or TIE index, which is both a more a global systolic and diastolic index of the RV. This is both with the here with the tissue Doppler and here with the pulse Doppler and the TAPC, which looks more at the systolic function of the RV. So those are mainly methods to look at the RV, assess its function and the pulmonary hypertension. And I think it's very important to have an understanding of this disease as a cardiopulmonary disease rather than just a local lung problem. So now we change gears and look at the evolution of management of the CDH in the last four decades. Uh, why is it important to know the history and evolution of how we care for a disease? I think uh, philosophically uh, and in general, there are two main reasons. One is not to repeat the mistakes that people before us did. Uh, and, and, and the second more important one is that to learn new knowledge, we have to unlearn uh, the old ones. Otherwise, it becomes dogma. And that's uh, you know, one way that we cannot achieve progress if we stuck, if we're stuck in dogma. So for myself, I have simplified the progress in uh, care for CDH in, in these three uh, main areas. Uh, the first quote is from JT Wong in Colombia, who says that the best interventions in healthcare are the ones that interfere least with nature's own mechanism. Uh, my translation of it is that people with good intentions who want to make the numbers look normal cause the most harm uh, in any field, not just medicine. Uh, the second one is from Kolobov at the National Institute of Health that most of the lung injury is man-made and it's not just in CDH, in a lot of areas. Dr. Bone talked to you about problems that we have with ventilating lungs. And the third one is, you know, my own uh, <laughs> deduction from this is that if what you are achieving to do causes harm, maybe then you should change your goalposts. And in this case, it was tolerating hypercapnia, hypercarbia, decade by decade. So just an example of it, before 1985, so uh, when I was uh, in 1985, I was a third year medical student, the treatment was to hyperventilate the PACO2 into 30s or even sometimes lower and bring the pH up to 7.45 and above to treat pulmonary hypertension. Then later in uh, late 90s, early 20s, this is in Dr. Bone's article that um, they changed the recommendation to have a pCO2 in mid 40s to low 50s and keep the pH around 7.3. Uh, and, and, and as you can see, the goalpost changed again as recently as you know, 2016. The, the, late, the last European CDH consortium recommendations was to have a, an aim, to have aim uh, PCO2 to be in between 50 to 70 and the pH about 7.2, uh, considering that the cardiac output and perfusion is normal or acceptable. So just to show you, uh, this is not anything of importance today, but they had evidence. This is from Drummond and Gregory. You know, Gregory is the person who popularized CPAP and is a very famous pediatric anesthetist. Drummond was a neonatologist. They showed that if you, you know, um, give enough pressure and ventilate long fast enough, you can bring the pH to above 7.5. And when you reach that, you can see they showed, oh, see, your PaO2 increased. Uh, and also they showed that if you can ventilate the child hard enough to bring the pCO2 below 30, see, the PO2 increased. So they had evidence to show for it. These are in five children. Uh, but at what cost? Uh, you know, the cost was uh, damaging the lungs um, and also at that time they didn't know that the neonatal cerebral blood flow depends on the CO2 and how much uh, intracranial hemorrhage they caused, who knows. So, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time but I would like to read through this and I know it's not a good practice to read this slide for the audience but this guy is Dr. Everett Coop who was a Surgeon General of the United States. He's, one of the foremost pediatric surgeons uh, of uh, 20th century he was the head of the new pediatric sur surgery at uh, Philadelphia Children's and the first editor of the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. I I'll read this for you. I know you can read yourself, but um, he says, I will never forget my most spectacular diaphragmatic hernia. I raced 11 blocks to the other hospital, ran up to the ninth floor, wrapped the baby in a blanket, ran down, placed the baby on the floor of my car by the heater. Back at the children's, I ran up two flights to the OR and laid the baby on the table. By now, the little fellow looked life lifeless. 
Without taking any sterile precautions, I slashed an incision across the left side of the chest. This is not from cinema or television. You know, he was a very, you know, he was the head of pediatric surgery at CHOP. I slashed an incision across the left side of the chest, inserted my fingers and pulled down the abdominal organs. Then I began to massage his tiny heart with one finger. It began to beat. Then at that time, they inserted it in the tracheal tube into the baby and I completed the operation. So this was the quintessential neonatal uh, surgical emergency, somewhat similar to what is a, an obstructed, you know, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection in pediatric cardiac surgery, but even worse. Um, that was just a story from that time. The other thing we learned from the lessons of the uh, last four decades was that uh, collaboration works. You know, you know, get, getting together, putting your data together, looking at see what works and what doesn't work actually teaches people something, not to keep repeating the same mistakes. And if somebody does something correct and see what they do, which makes their numbers better. And they also saw that the high volume centers do better. So it's very important that any country, you know, I'm not familiar with is the arrangement in Iran that does this you have all the centers connected together, share their data, sit together and, and see what they can do to make the outcomes better. So this is the general historical evolution and I'm not going to do through that. The main um, mechanisms that improve the uh, outcome, you know, when, I, when, I went, when I finished medical school, the survival was 50%. Today, the survival is almost 90%. Uh, you know, better understanding of the disease that it is not a, a mechanical physical lung problem it's a cardiopulmonary disease uh, gentle ventilation delayed surgery um, helped a lot to improve the, the outcome of this so these are the areas that i'm going to talk about deferred surgical repair pulmonary based dilator therapy non-injurious ventilation understanding of the congenital diaphragmatic hernia as a cardiopulmonary disease and ecmo I don't know if there is ECMO in Iran or not, but I know in adults, sometimes they temporarily leave them on the pump, uh, you know, like a temporary ECMO, but I don't know in children. So this is, this is slide is from Dr. Lally in, in Texas from the uh, CDHS study group. Uh, as you can see, uh, about 25 years ago, most children uh, got operated on during their first two days of life. And now most children get operated on you know, much later than that. Um, this is slide is from Dr. Bone. There are many reasons that immediately post uh, operatively the child will do poorly. Uh, obviously a child who had sick lungs, not enough lung volume, not enough lung, lung, lung vasculature and had pulmonary hypertension, you put them through anesthesia, we cut them, we, we put a cut in their chest. Uh, and so now they have reduced uh, combined pulmonary and chest wall compliance. They still have pulmonary hypertension. Their LV and RV dysfunction still exist. So you can see that there have all sorts of reasons to do poorly immediately post-op if you did them early. Um, and that uh, practice has changed quite a bit. Pulmonary vasodilator therapy, just to make it uh, brief, there's been randomized controlled trials, there have been brief studies, and all of them have shown that uh, giving inhaled nitric oxide and this disease does not work in general. Uh, so this is the summary uh, that inhaled nitric oxide has not been shown to improve the survival in CDH in general. Uh, in the uh, CDH study group data, the use of inhaled nitric oxide is actually associated with increase in mortality uh, and also increase in ECMO use. We go back to this later baby, part of it is because it increases pulmonary venous return in a child who has LA and LV hypertension and LV dysfunction. So that makes things worse. Um, individual patients, individual patients might benefit from use of inhaled nitric oxide or sildenafil, but has, that has to be in the context of echo monitoring and physiological monitoring. Uh, and if the child, does not respond with improvement in oxygenation or improvement in pulmonary hypertension parameters in one and a half to two hours, then you've got to stop the treatment. Long protective ventilation strategies. So this is a, this, this slide is from a study which is not related to CDH. These group of researchers, uh, they took uh, some newborn animals, I forgot rabbits or rats, 
Um, and this was a surfactant study, but there, there were two arms. One, of, one arm was uh, given big breath uh, at uh, uh, the onset of life. The other group did not receive big breath at the onset of life. They gave them six breath, and I think the breath were something like 25 cc per kilo, which is quite big breath. And, and this is the, uh, so they um, um, did this uh, after the, uh, the animals uh, were sacrificed and uh, did the pathology of the lungs. As you can see in this high magnification here, you see all these inflammatory cells, you see the hyaline membrane, um, and you see the disruption you know, in the basement membrane. So these are all changes that you see in hyaline, so-called hyaline membrane disease or ARDS. Uh, and in contrast, the animals that were not given the six big breath have a lung that has normal thin, you know, alveolar walls and good aerated spaces and no hyaline membrane, so normal lung. Uh, so as a few as six large breath can do this. Uh, this is a study from sick kids that again, they saw all of these changes that you see in in ARDS or, or uh, alveolar, you know, hyalinosis or hyaline membrane disease, not only in the ipsilateral, ipsilateral means the lung that it has the, the hernia on the side, but also on the other side. So, and that's a very, very important thing. So this is the good side, supposedly, and this is the CDH side. And you can see all of these changes very pronounced in, in both lungs. So, this is a very important uh, article, very important study from John Tian Wung. Uh, John Tian Wung is a very, very interesting character. Uh, he is an obstetrician, an aesthetist, and pediatrician, and he's the only person that the, the people, family, uh, parents of, of premature babies in, in New York established a prize called Thanks God for John Tian Wung Prize and gave it to him. Uh, so in 1985, he took 15 term neonates with PPHN, pulmonary hypertension, that had mortality, predicted mortality of 100% because of the severity of their illness and their oxygenation. And at that time, the established accepted treatment was to muscle intubate them, muscle relax them, uh, hyperventilate them, give them bicarbonate, and that was the treatment. So what he did is he did not muscle relax any of them. Uh, he did not hyperventilate any of them. Uh, they were bringing the PCO2 down to something like 20 to 25 at that time. So he let the PCO2 go up to 60. So he did all things that were considered malpractice at that time. I don't know how he, how he got the consent, but, and the PO2, you know, they were trying to keep the PO2 in high 90s. He kept it at 50 to 70. Um, and didn't must relax any of those children. What he did is uh, he sometimes ventilated them at rates as fast as 100 to 150. Obviously, the eye, the eye time was very sh brief, and he didn't give that much of PEEP because if you have a rate of 150 and you ventilate it with a PEEP and eye time, you develop dynamic hyperinflation. So all of these children survived, and all of them were supposed to die. So... Uh, the same author in, a, in Columbia group with Dr. Walker, who was their surgeon, published in, in 2002 uh, their experience with 120 patients with the same treatment. They were using HFOV also at this time. Uh, and they had an 84% survival in operated ones, which was a very good number at that time by avoiding hyperventilation, by uh, uh, looking after these children more physiologically. So, um, you know, if I want to make some generalizations, again, you know, individual patients might be different, but as I said, as few as six big breaths at birth or in the early neonatal period can cause permanent lung injury and make the outcome worse. So you have to avoid that at any cost. At sick kids, our recommendation was always to intubate these children at the beginning. Now, in the, at least in the European consortium recommendation, they say, if the baby doesn't have risk factors and looks fine, and you can give them some minutes to see what they do in room, in you know spontaneous breathing, 
uh, if, you, if you have to bag the child, you have to make sure always you have an inline manometer and, and your inspiratory pressure does not go above 20 to 25 centimeter. One of the biggest problems that people have a tendency to give big and fast breath whenever they <laughs> want to bag somebody. So this takes a lot of conscious effort and observing the number uh, to limit yourself to that peak pressure. Uh, when you make ven ventilatory changes and the child doesn't do better or, or deteriorates, always be cautious of effects of ventilation and pressure on the right and left heart. Maybe those are the effects that the oxygenation or the hemodynamic deteriorated rather than in the um, rather than that you had to go up on oxygen or pressure. Um, or, or also using high frequency oscillatory ventilation, which I'm not sure if it's available in Iran or not, early rather than late, before having caused lung damage by injurious ventilation, or before having had a lot of significant cardiopulmonary embarrassment to the point that the kid is now under a lot of pressures and is hypotensive. So that's another important factor to consider. So um, if you don't have an oscillator, like many places in the world, you might use, you might, uh, you know, want to use the method that Dr. Wong in Colombia used. So he called it high frequency positive pressure ventilation. And so if you are at the rate of 40 to 60 and your peak pressure is 20 to 25 centimeter of water, your peak is 3 to 5, uh, and you still have a very high CO2 and preductal sats are below 80-85%, then what he used to do, and you can still do it, he would put the rate up to, which I haven't done it myself though, 80 to 100, with an eye time of about 0.3 seconds, and he would choose a peak of 0 to 1, and a peak pressure of 20. And in his hands, that worked quite well. This is a more recent study, which uh, shows that if you're, if you can even go lower on your PEEP and keep the lungs still expanded, that might be better for the lungs than having a normal, you know, PEEP, usual PEEP of four to five that people use. There were 17, and this is a pilot study, 17 infants with CDH and severe pulmonary hypertension, that they, it was a prospective randomized crossover study, but PEEP of two and PEEP of five. They did not change the amplitude, meaning you know the, the the size of the breath was the same. So they brought the peak pressure down when they changed the, the peak to two. Uh, so you can see that both both oxygenation ventilation parameters improved when on peak of two, and hemodynamic parameters were either better or the same, but no physical no statistical significance difference here. As you can see, that the compliance of the lung was a lot better on PEEP of two compared to PEEP of five. So that's another thing to consider, you know, if you have a problem, if you can bring your PEEP down. And this is the uh, uh, last uh, study in this section that I want to uh, point to. This is a randomized controlled trial of comparing um, high frequency oscillatory ventilation with conventional mechanical ventilation. So they random, this is a European study that came out in 2016. They randomized the neonates to be started on oscillation or on conventional mechanical ventilation without, you know, so they didn't use HFOE as rescue. They saw that statistically there was no difference in mortality or BPD at 28 days, though there was a trend towards increased BPD mortality one oscillator but it's statistically not different. And they saw that the duration of ventilation uh, and the duration of ICU stay was longer and also going to extracorporeal membrane uh, oxygenation with HFOV and that favored conventional. So the problem that they have with this study is that they were, I forgot how many centers, but some of these centers had five patients per year, the low volume centers. Um, and, uh, and I think, HFOV uh, is a very good uh, tool, is a very good a strategy to use, but it also is a very strong, um, you know, not only just because it makes noises, but, but it's a treatment that if one is not diligent, that if uh, doesn't stand at the bedside, as Dr. Cox said, and look at how the patient's uh, hemodynamic oxygenation, ventilation, and lung volume behaves in response to this treatment can cause a lot of damage. I had a colleague and mentor at SickKids, Dr. Kavanaugh, used to say that uh, the one problem he had with randomized controlled trial is that they, they put everybody into a basket 
And a treatment might harm some people, might benefit some people, but if you only look at the average number, we never know who was harmed by it. So uh, these are some general principles that I have for myself when I put a patient on HFOV. If, if we put a patient on HFOV, uh, it doesn't matter, either diaphragm or other, and they, they deteriorate from the standpoint of gas exchange or hemodynamics, think about the effect of HFOV because it's a high mean ever pressure a strategy, not particularly in CDAs, but in others. Uh, and it can reduce you know, your preload and affect your cardiac performance. Maybe you need a bit of volume, maybe you need a bit of inotropy or vasopressors. Uh, in ARDS, you know, either neonatal RDS or, or adult, or, you know, older child RDS, the problem is that you need to recruit the lungs and it's a high lung volume strategy with HFOV. There's no lung to recruit in diaphragmatic hernia. So if we follow the same strategy as we use in HFOV in ARDS, then we are bound to damage the lungs and cause hemodynamic embarrassment. So you have to do an X-ray to make sure, and, and I will do the X-ray in 15, 20 minutes after putting the patient on HFOV, uh, to make sure that they have not overexpanded the lungs. We do not want flat diaphragms in this disease. It's different. You have to count the ribs. And I don't exceed eight ribs, you know, posteriorly. Uh, the other thing is that for HFOV to work, you need to have a certain frequency in delta P, and it should not be too low. It actually defeats the purpose of some putting somebody in HFOV if you put the, the frequency low. And I've seen people, when the CO2 is high, they keep going down on the, on the frequency, and, and putting a neonate on a frequency of six or seven is actually giving them too big a breath. You know, it defeats the purpose of putting on HFOV, which, you know, is the ultimate non-injurious lung ventilation. Uh, what I do in my practice is I usually never go, you know, I put it to 10 to 12. There are some people who start even at 15 hertz for a small neonate. And if I need to optimize my ventilation and my CO2, then I go up on the delta P. Um, so also you have to be very vigilant of the complications of so this is a complication that you usually see in premature babies, but this is not a patient with CDH. But, this, but if you have a patient on HFOV who's been doing fine and then it starts to have retention of CO2 uh, or in X-ray, you see an X-ray like this, you've got to think about a pulmonary interstitial emphysema, the, air tra the barotrauma that Dr. Cox talked about. Uh, and the only way to see this is that, you know, you have to do the X-ray, and also, you know, pay attention to any change, a small change in PCO2 if it goes up. HFOV is a disease that humidification, is a, sorry, it's a treatment that humidification is very, very important in it. And um, also change in position, sedation. So a lot of the small details people have to pay attention to. And I'm afraid uh, people who don't have a lot of experience with it and see a few number of patients uh, but, and do HFOV yearly, they may not pay attention to all these details and they say the treatment didn't work or was harmful. So uh, the use of ECMO. Again, as I said, I don't know if you have ECMO in Tehran or not, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Uh, this data is from a, a study group uh, in Houston. As you can see, in, this, these are mainly American centers. There are not many Canadian centers in these, but, um, or, or European centers. Uh, almost half of patients in America in 2017-18 are operated on an ECMO, operated on an ECMO, which is quite different from the practice at sick kids. Uh, and uh, but ECMO has mortality and morbidity. This is from the UK neonatal ECMO data. And you can see majority of these children in long term had severe neuro, uh, neurological dysfunction. That's for them if they survive. So the question is, does the use of ECMO improve the outcome in CDH? This is now a classic study, all the study, tale of two cities that compared Boston and Toronto. And Toronto, a center that used rescue therapy with HFOV and no ECMO, and Boston at that time, half, a third to half of their patients were on ECMO pre-op or post-op. Uh, and the mortality, and, and as you can see, the survival wasn't that much different. Uh, so the other question was that now the era after that, which is the era of gentle ventilation, does HFO, does ECMO improve the outcome? So this was uh, the CDH registry to 2010, 
which I, I put this together when I was in Toronto still. As you can see, the uh, uh, putting patients on ECMO and CDH was very, uh, less than 1% at sick kids and about 31% in the rest of the patients. The overall survival was better at sick kids compared to the whole group. So in the era of gentle ventilation, you know, um, ECMO does not add to survival. And, and, and you can see this was the high risk group and still ECMO up to 2015 has an 80% mortality and for the ones who survive severe neurological deficits. So the main question is when you want to put somebody in ECMO is that at least that's the, that's the question that we ask ourselves or we ask, I'm not at Toronto anymore, but does this child have enough lung to be able to come off ECMO and go for surgery? In the States, often the child goes on ECMO and then gets operated on ECMO and then comes off operation on ECMO. So maybe this question is not asked very frequently there, but, but you've got to ask yourself, how do I know there is enough lung? It's a difficult question to answer, but some direct and indirect evidence of having had difficult enough lung is that if this child at any time had preductal sats of at least 85% in FI2 of 0.5 or less, then the, some children deteriorate, but at least have had to, you know, and you can choose an arbitrary number, two hours, four hours, had, had that relative stability. The first blood gases usually indicate, especially the PCO2, uh, if the child had enough lung to, for gas exchange. A second question is that how do we know there is no irreversible lung disease due to injurious ventilation? If a child is referred to an ECMO center after a week of injurious ventilation where they have been bagging this kid 10 times a day with high pressures, then that's a kid that should not go on ECMO, but, but we need to find a way to ascertain that. Uh, and uh, uh, how do we know if the rise in pulmonary hypertension and our heart dysfunction is indeed reversible? So one of the, again, the number of patients with uh, CDH who went on ECMO was very little at sick kids, but one of the main reasons to go on was deterioration after stability, usually due to sepsis or a mechanical problem or something like that. So I'm not going to talk about the indications for ECMO. I'll just jump into the how generally, the gen again, individual patients might be different, but the general principles of management. How much time left do I have? Can you hear me? Okay, so yes, we, ha we oh. can hear you. So we might have like uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. So uh, the suggestion that you know, we all had was that these children be delivered at, uh, uh, at a center that has experience. So at sick kids, they were born on the other side of the street and brought down through a tunnel. Uh, because we didn't have a, 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 a delivery suite at sick kids. Um, children, the suggestion is that they should be intubated right after birth and we avoid bagging. Do an x-ray to make sure there's no problem with the tube and other things. Uh, right after delivery, aim for SATs above 80%, preductally, right arm, and use low distending pressures, less than 24, 25 centimeter of water. Put an NGT and suction it. Uh, and we do not use surfactant. There is evidence surfactant actually increases mortality. If the child's blood pressure is soft, then you give 10 cc kilo. You can repeat it a couple of times because uh, having a, a normal blood pressure is very important. So when they come to the ICU, we aim for a preductal sat of 85%. If they're hemodynamically fine, meaning their perfusion is good, they're passing urine, their lactate is low, you can accept uh, sats more than 80%. If the, if the perfusion is good. The, you know, the target PCO2 is a moving target, but generally if the target is between 45 to 60 with the pH above 7 to 7.25 is acceptable with good perfusion. Uh, we, we still start children on conventional mechanical ventilation, uh, an initial setting of PEEP less than 25, PEEP of 3, 4, a rate of 40. We use oscillation as a rescue. But so the important thing is that we don't keep up going on the pressure on conventional ventilation until the child has deterioration. If you are at the peak pressure of 24 and, uh, and your child is still uh, desatting or CO2s are high, you go to HFOV. With a mean of a pressure of 12 to 14, a frequency of, it's between 10 to 15, but you know, usually you can start at 12. 
delta P of 35 to 50. You look at the shake and usually you aim to see that the thighs, proximal thighs are shaking also. You do a full echo study on the first day and then when there's there any deterioration, you do an echo. Uh, you need a good cyst aortic root pressure because the RV gets its blood flow in systole and diastole. So, and uh, if the blood pressure is soft, especially systolic, you can give a couple of fluid boluses with the start of vasopressors. Um, and um, as I said, we usually start epinephrine. If the patient is still uh, hypertensive after 0.1 mic of that, we start, we add norepi and give hydrocortisone to the baby. Our neonatology colleagues like mildrenone, but I think one should not use mildrenone at the cost of blood pressure. We rarely use melanin in units with CDH. You know, if you have a lot of RV dysfunction and the blood pressure is good or high, that's something you can consider. Um, so if you get into problems with pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction uh, and you are an oscillator and things are not working, you have to make sure that the doctors is not becoming restrictive. So it's important to look at the velocity of the flow across that doctors, even if it's not bi-directional. If it's restrictive, the velocity is more than one and a half meters, so to speak, and you have a problem with RV, then you have to make that doctors open with prostaglandin. Uh, if you see a new mitral regurgitation and left to right chunt at the atrial level, an enlargement of the LA, then these are signs of LV dysfunction, which we talked about before. And giving nitric oxide to this child actually may make things worse and push them towards uh, ECMO or cause mortality. Um, so, you know, shunt is not your enemy if the perfusion is good. So remember that, that if you have good oxygen delivery, tissue perfusion is good, lactate is low, urine output is good and you have reasonable CNS, sorry, central venous sacs, if you measured that, um, then, then you're okay, even if you have a shunt, a right to left shunt. One uh, monitoring system that we use a sick kids is forehead and flank nears, which you can use for tissue perfusion and oxygenation. Um, so uh, I talked about nitric oxide. If you use it, you have to monitor the uh, pulmonary artery pressure, and this is of oxygenation and hemodynamics. If there's no improvement in one to two hours, you stop it. Um, and if there is systemic to suprasystemic RV pressure, with the restrictive or closing duct, you start prostaglandin. So uh, we talk, to, we don't send them to surgery until they are physiologically stable, meaning their SATs are good on less than 50% or less FI2. They have come off high dose of pressors. Uh, and they have good gas exchange, good hemodynamics, off oscillator. And uh, it's very different from the US that they send children on ECMO for repair. After operation, usually do the same thing. We make sure that they have good urine output. So 48 hours after operation, they pee less than one cc per kilo per hour and they look a bit puffy. We start gentle diuresis and we start feeds in this consultation with surgeons and, and, and they're all on anti-reflux treatment. So we don't put a chest strain, this is a slide is from John Tien Wong again. Uh, you can see that putting a chest strain causes uh, injury to the lung because of the uh, negative pressure, ipsilateral lung overexpansion. So I'm not gonna talk about the predictors of outcome a lot, but in multiple studies, uh, long to head ratio, gestational age, APGAR, size of the defect, and having cardiac anomalies have been important. The bigger the, the, bigger the defect, the higher the mortality. Uh, the smaller the defect, the, you know, the mortality you expect to be low. Also, you can see that somebody who has a big defect, almost 100% of them have neurological, pulmonary, gastrointestinal morbidity. Uh, this is how they measure the long to head ratio. This is the contralateral lung, the good lung. They measure the longest diameter, transverse diameter. This is at the level of the four chamber of the heart. And they divide it over the head circumference. Um, if it's more than 1.3, 1.4, associate better outcome. Because the lung and head grow in different proportions and this LHR increases. So they have an index called observed to expected LHR. And if that is less than 25%, then the mortality is very, very high. Um, I'm not gonna talk about these. Um, so who is this violin maker? 
This is Dr. Virginia Apgar, who was a very expert violin maker in addition to being a big, a very good anesthetist. Uh, what is new in, so I'll just talk about a few things. Uh, when the baby's born, what they do is that they put a clamp on the umbilical cord. What does that do? Is that it acutely reduces the preload to the LV and acutely increases the afterload to the LV. And, and initially in CDH, LV dysfunction is even more important than RV dysfunction. So there is a study uh, to, I don't know if they've started recruiting. It was supposed to be start this year, but with COVID, I don't know. A European study that is supposed to, not to clamp the, um, the randomized neonates, not to clamp the umbilical cord until there is uh, uh, phys uh, um, pulmonary stability, meaning that either the child is, is spontaneously breathing and is stable or is intubated and is stable. And they didn't specify how much time, uh, but that can be up to two or three hours. Uh, and so this is, the, this is the physiological reasoning behind it. Uh, until the, the LV is loaded well and uh, and the hemodynamic is more stable than the clamps. So this study, I don't think has started recruiting yet. Then there's another study, oral sildenafil to the mother, because sildenafil goes through placenta and the concentration of it in the, ba in the fetus is as high as in the mother. Uh, and this was uh, supposed to start recruiting this year too, but I don't think they have started that in humans yet. In, in animals, it was associated significantly with the reduction in pulmonary hypertension. Also, previous study, the umbilical cord in animals it had good results. And then there is another study, which again, it's in Europe, to randomize to sildenafil IV or inhaled nitric oxide. I'm not very sure what is the point of this because we already know that inhaled nitric oxide does not give good results, but this is another study. I think it's easier to use IV sildenafil in places that don't have access to the gas and the machine that gives it. And then there is another study, which I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about, FETO. And so theoretically, if a baby's lung fluid uh, stays in it, then it helps the growth of the lung. So uh, the baby in utero, the, through endoscopy, they put a balloon in the trachea, and the, before the baby is born, they deflate the balloon. In Canada, this was part of a study which have not recruited as many patients. In America, you can actually do this outside the study. So there are some centers who offer this. If you are an ex observed to expect an LHR of less than 25, they offer it to the parents. So end of the story. <laughs> to make it uh, a brief into a few lines, CDH is a physiological emergency, not a surgical one. And the main problems are heart function, both left and right, cardiopulmonary interactions and pulmonary hypertension. And it has long-term morbidity related to these. Uh, we need to treat the combined cardiopulmonary function of the patient and not the blood gases. Aim the preductal sats above 85% or 80% if the perfusion is good and you have no other option. Uh, start low dose epi and then a nor epi if after 30, 40, 60 kilo, your blood pressure is still soft. I'm not talking about hypotensive. You want a normal or a slightly higher systolic blood pressure. When the RV function is poor and the ductus is restrictive, do open the duct and keep it open and then control with daily echoes. As I said, inhaled nitric oxide may work in individual patients, but monitor and if there's no response, stop it in two hours. And ECMO is an option, it has considerable mortality and morbidity. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohseni, for this amazing and interesting lecture on congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So, um, I had a question. Like, actually, I, as a pediatric resident here in Children Medical Center, I've been into a few uh, CDH births. And uh, I asked Dr. Qayyib to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but uh, we usually intubate them immediately. And uh, we, we don't have ECMO uh, here in Iran right now, but uh, we, we, could, we both use uh, conventional uh, ventilation and also HFOV in our, some of our centers. But, uh, and the conventional uh, ventilation that we use, the setup that we use, usually we use uh, higher PIPs, like four to six uh, millimeters, of, uh, millimeters for them. And centimeters of water. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's <laughs> good. Of water. And we usually use higher peeps for them. And 
uh, you were there was a part of your lecture you were talking about lower peeps like one to two which would provide adequate oxygenation for these patients and it confused me a little could you explain that no it's, so that's not that's not what we routinely do i pointed that there is that the uh, dr john tian wong in colombia Mm -hmm. um, his recommendation is that if at the regular conventional ventilation, meaning, you know, ventilating a child at the rate of 40 to 60 with, uh, you know, peak pressure of 23, 24 and peep of 3 to 4, uh, you cannot oxygenate and ventilate them adequately. You still, your preductal sats are less than 80, 85 and your CO2 is prohibitively high. And if you don't have an oscillator, then you can use your regular conventional ventilator at a much higher rate, at the rate up to 100. Because if you give a lot of PEEP, even normal, so to speak, PEEP, a normal eye time at a rate of 100, then you will develop dynamic hyperinflation, like the child has bad asthma, you know. Uh, so you have to make your eye time brief and you may have to make your PEEP small. Uh, if you have an oscillator, use the oscillator, you know, the oscillator is, the, but again, even if you use the oscillator, you have to pay attention to those things, you know, with, the, with an oscillator, if you put a neonate on a, you know, if the CO2 is very high and you want to get rid of it fast, you put them on a, a smaller frequency, which in oscillator makes the big breath, it defeats the purpose of being on an oscillator because your breath is too big. So, and also an oscillator, as small changes, you have to monitor the response to them. Uh, rather than waiting, you know, for half a day to see what happens. So you have to stand at the bedside. You have to make sure that the child, you know, is hemodynamically stable. When you put them on the oscillator, see what happens to the oxygenation, what happens to the, you do blood gas in 15, 20 minutes, in 20 minutes, and you do an x-ray. You do not want hyperinflation. You do not want flat diaphragms. Uh, and uh, so I think it, it takes a lot. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and if Dr. Peter Mostani, wants but, to add anything. Uh, uh, Dr. Mostani, but I, I have a question uh, about transferring these patients. Many times we have to transfer them before uh, stabilization because in many places here we have, uh, there is a resource, uh, resource uh, limited area. So we uh -huh. may diagnose because of the boat shaped uh, abdomen and uh -huh. uh, deep uh, uh, respirations and respiratory distress we are suspicious we get suspicious uh, to congenital diaphragmatic hernia and we have to transfer them soon because uh, even before stabilization because we may not uh, be able to stabilize them so how are the recommendations for their uh, transfer because and even they may not uh, there, there uh, may not be uh, ventilators for uh, transferring them i have transferred one of them from Esferayen to Bojnurt in Khorasan mm -hmm. uh, with uh, just bagging uh, for one hour, about one hour. So how, how is your advice for transferring this kind of patients before a stabilization yes. so, in resource limited setting? So I'll give you my opinion. And if, um, if Peter or Shamiel or online, they can give their input also. But so, uh, um, you know, from my standpoint, um, a child who shows up after birth, because most children now in Canada or America or Europe are diagnosed antenatally, yeah? Most, they, they have been diagnosed through a routine, uh, you know, antenatal ultrasound. Uh, and so you know, and then you arrange for them to come closer to a center. So if you have that advantage that somebody does an ultrasound and diagnose it, then you should tell them that the mother should come for delivery to the center close to your hospital. That's one thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Second, a child who is diagnosed after birth, two days, three days after birth, often has a better prognosis if we don't screw things up, you know, because it means, you know, that, that the child was born, didn't have symptom signs in the first day or two of life or three of life, and then later became symptomatic. So if we can manage that child, you know, uh, in a cautious way, they should actually have mortality much lower than, than the regular children. Also, you know, I showed you the size of the defect. A child with the left side of diaphragmatic hernia, which is a small or medium, should not die because the ones who die are the ones who bit big ones, you know, or the ones of other risk factors. So, 
But to make it simpler for you, I think it's important when people think about it to put an NG tube for the child, not to actively bag the child. If they intubate, they need to put a manometer uh, so they can actually see the amount of pressure they are delivering to the child. If they do not have a manometer, then they, they have, then they have to, you know, I would put the FI to, to 100% and I would just give enough pressure to raise the chest a bit, you know, so because it's difficult for people to know what the pressure is if they don't have a manometer. Um, but those are the things that I, I think you can do. Uh, if my colleagues have other suggestions, they can tell you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Me. So, and, and we could actually use Dr. Koop's story and his method of transferring these patients on the back of his car. <laughs> just... <laughs> no, don't do things. Don't, don't do things that did the way that. Uh... Well, we're talking about resource limited countries. <laughs> uh, no, he <laughs> operated. He slashed the kid's chest without even giving him and yes. cleaning him. That was actually an action story. Story. <laughs> it really no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was a real thing. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Mohsen, for this amazing lecture. So we're running a bit uh, behind of our schedule. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sevi. Dr. Sevi, are you with us still? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay, so yes, we can hear you. So Dr. Sevi, let me just give, you, give our audiences a small introduction, uh, although I'm pretty sure that they know you very well. So Dr. Shanimo Sevi is a consultant and the medic, uh, medical lead of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital and a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Their unit is the largest PIC in the whole continent of Africa. They have a Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship Training Program, which trains pediatric intensivists, not just for South Africa, but for the whole country. So Dr. Sevi, thank you for joining us again. We're so honored to have you tonight as well again and we are ready for you whenever you are. Good. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, yes, we can hear you and I just made you a co-host. I just and want to... Just uh, so sorry for this, but we are running a bit low, so we're having maximum of 25 minutes for your presentation, if it's possible for you to That's... keep that in mind. Fine, you give me a 10 minute warning, okay? Can you, okay. Can you do that? So, so, yes. And then I'll try and keep it short. So, I apologize for my intervenience previously. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm really, you know, I'll keep it, try and keep it short and maybe just focus on the critical care aspects of asthma, not going into too much detail. So, I have to obligatorily show you a picture of Cape Town for Peter. Peter um, um, trained in Cape Town as well. So just to show you Table Mountain and the beautiful city that I live in. And hopefully, you know, you people from Iran can come and visit. That is Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens with the mountains in the background. And this is the Red Cross Hall Memorial Children's Hospital that I work at. Sorry, just to interrupt you for a second. Both Hadi, Masenibod and myself, worked within those very walls that you're showing us. Thank you. <laughs> Just to make you feel a bit homesick, Peter. Um, so just to talk about where we're going to go is talk about a little bit about the pathophysiology of asthma. I'm not going to focus too much on medical treatment, but more point out the difficulties uh, of managing these kids in ICU. Heidi spoke about dogma. Um, you know, that for many years, I think the dogma has been that PEEP or positive pressure uh, can be dangerous in children with asthma. But we'll talk about through some of the physiological benefits thereof, go through a little bit about mechanical ventilation and talk about outcomes of children admitted to ICU with severe asthma. So I think we all know that, you know, with asthma, it's airway inflammation, we've got smooth muscle mediated bronchoconstriction, You've got intraluminal plugging with uh, mucus. There's increased airways resistance. You have an increasing uh, lung uh, volumes and physiological dead space. And just to remind you, uh, of the, in terms of airways in infants, if you're having airway edema, you're increasing 
the resistance of airflow within your small airways by more by about 16 times, which reads which leads to an increased work of breathing. Um, the equal pressure point in the lung, it's something that is worthwhile thinking about and considering. But when we talk about the equal pressure point in the lung, it's the point where the pressure in the airway equals the pleural pressure. And with children with severe asthma, this equal pressure point in the lung moves more distally in the lung. So moves to the bronchioles, which, was, which do not have cartilaginous support. So they tend to close down, which means that there's increased effort in exhalation and it leads to airway obstruction and to worsening hyperinflation. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can manipulate this equal pressure point a little bit later. Uh, and following on, if you're struggling to exhale, you, what you'll find is if you look at your lung volumes on the left and over time, if you're inhaling and you're not exhaling completely, what will happen is that you will have airway obstruction with progressive dynamic hyperinflation as your air trapping worsens. Now asthma, you know, the kids that are get admitted to, to ICUs, some of them are gradually deteriorating over, over some time. But there's a small group of children that, with, um, that can, with, with very little warning, have a severe um, asthma attack. And in Melbourne in 2016, there was a thunderstorm um, that triggered a, sort of a severe asthma outbreak in a number of children where, where pollen sort of decreased in size, got into the airways. So children that were relatively well controlled suddenly had a, a near life threatening events. If we're looking at risk factors for intensive care admission in children in a study from the Netherlands, a relatively recent study, children were older. Um, the other thing that was significant is that they found that children had symptoms for more than a week um, tended to be admitted to intensive care with life threatening asthma. And also, you know, smoking. I'm not sure how big smoking is in Iran, but ex smoke, exposure to smoke is a significant risk factor for severe asthma. So in terms of scoring, you know, um, there, are set, there, are, there are few asthma scores, but good clinical examination is vital when, you, when you're faced with a child with, with severe asthma. And you're trying to decide, you know, how, how severe they are um, clinically. And you, when you, and most asthma therapies um, in outpatients uh, or casualties, there's a very stepwise therapeutic approach. So it's important to actually know what they looked like on admission and with each, each intervention to track their saturations, respiratory rates and work of breathing and decide if they're deteriorating or improving. And the children who are not responding are the ones that you need to be stepping up and increasing your, your management. So warning signs, kids that are desaturated, silent chests, kids with severe asthma might not be able to do a peak flow. Um, children that are exhausted if they've been sick for a while, if they've been using huge amounts of energy to breathe in and exhale, um, if they're exhausted, they might go into respiratory arrest. That's an as one asthma score. There isn't one valid. There are a couple of asthma scores out there. I'm not sure one is anyone is particularly better than the other. This is our asthma protocol that we use at Red Cross. Um, with COVID, there's been a lot of discussion about NEBS and non-invasive type ventilation. But if you're a hypoxic um, and you've got severe increased work of breathing, then one one would still start with short-acting um, bronchodilators. Uh, beta agonist. I know there's some difference in drugs. We use salbutamol in Cape Town um, and combine that with Atrovent and children either get intermittent or continuous nebulizers. We'll, if they're not improving, then one would consider the next step would be salbutamol intravenously as a load. And this is, this is probably variation between countries and centers, but it's important, I think, that each hospital has an asthma protocol um, with logical steps and with a clear idea as to how to escalate when children are not responding. We tend to get called at the point where children have had nebulizers probably for what, an hour, but they're not responding when the doctors in our casualties are considering IV salbutamol and IV bronchodilator. Um, we also have a low threshold to start children on non-invasive type ventilation, high flow with CPAP, and that's when we tend to, to get involved. Um, 
in terms of carbon dioxide levels. You know, you're, if they're becoming tired and exhausted, carbon dioxide levels will be increasing. So it's important to probably get a baseline. I tend to not look too much at blood gases, but tend to look more clinically at children's effort and the responses to therapies. So good clinical examination, tracking the responses over time and escalating therapies to children in children that are not responding. I think you know, when I started out in intensive care, we used to intubate many more children than we do at the moment. And non-invasive type ventilation has really changed what we do in intensive care. It reduces work of breathing. It, uh, children that are exhausted, um, you can turn them around, you can hold them off, you can reduce their hypoxemia. And a lot of non-invasive type, type ventilation um, has, has, you know, prevents you from intubating children. And a lot of this has actually moved into children with, with asthma. This diagram um, that was published in PCCM, you know, if you, if you just take the time to look at it, if you look towards the right, we're talking of negative pressures and spontaneous breathing. To the left of it, we're looking at positive pressures and exhalation. And it's a very good editorial to go and read because it talks about non-invasive ventilation. There's, there's good physiological rationale, but many people are in the dogma is that PEEP uh, is bad in asthmatics. But if you look at, if you understand the physiology, it, it makes sense. And what we're trying to, to say with this diagraph is that if you're looking at children as with severe asthma that are breathing spontaneously, they're needing to generate a large negative intrathoracic pressure to breathe in. And with your equal pressure point that is shifted more distally in the lungs with airway obstruction, they're needing to generate a fairly high pressure to breathe out against the airway obstruction. And if you think about A as being the equal pressure point in the lung, but if you're using non-invasive type ventilation, then they, the increased flow reduces their work of breathing in. So you're, you're supporting inspiration, you are supporting the inspiration so they you're expending less energy at breathing and when they're exhaling if you're using positive end expiratory pressure you're stenting your airways open and you allowing them to exhale and reducing the dynamic hyperinflation of the lung maybe just a lot more simplistically with external peep you you're splinting your airways open the hyperinflated lung with, in, with intrinsic PEEP, you're able to exhale, keep your airways open and improve gas exchange. So there's a growing body of literature about using non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, high flow, bi-level type ventilation in children safely. The Cochrane Review from 2016 only had two randomized controlled trials of using non-invasive type ventilation in children with asthma what they really concluded was that there was a reduction in asthma symptom scores, but the evidence was low quality uh, due to bias and imprecision. But non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, you know, it's quite difficult when you've got a child who's hypoxic and they're short of breath and they're anxious to put a mask on their face. Uh, you have to have a child that's cooperative, not pulling the masks off all the time you worry about delivering drugs to, to your airways, and you worry about over distending the, the stomach and further impairing ventilation. High flow nasal cannula, I think it's great because it feels, you know, it's not something heavy onto the face and children tend to tolerate the high flow nasal cannula much more than they do a CPAP mask, either prongs or nasal, than they do to having a harness and a mask that compresses their nose and sometimes their mouth as well. Uh, most of the circuits will have ports that you could put nib, nibs in. Um, we're, so we tend to use nebulizers on, with non-invasive type ventilation, but it's important that when you, uh, to think about where you're actually putting the nebulizer into the circuit. If you look at the circuit A, if that's your BiPAP type ventilator, that's your circuit. This is during inspiration. If you're putting your nebulizer, your gas flow close to the mask, 
and you're delivering quite a lot of bronchodilators to your patient during inspiration. If you look on the panel on the right in B, if you're putting your nebulizer connection further away from the mask in the tubing, then during inspiration, you'll get some flow, a little bit will be lost off by your valves. But when the patient starts exhaling, as the nebulized solution comes to the patient, some of this will be lost into the circuit and through your popple valves. If your nebulizer connection is further away from, from the mask, as the patient breathes out, you tend to lose a lot of your nebulized solution and it becomes less effective. So during exhalation, um, you lose a lot of the drug. So think carefully when you're using nebulizers. So once again, you've upscaled your asthma medication, you've tried some non-invasive ventilation, but your clinical examination is important. You're needing to monitor the child to see if they're improving. Um, you know, I'm not sure Heidi and, P and Peter have, have intubated asthmatics, but it's something that it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it's fraught with danger, but at some point, if children present in extremis, if they're not responding to, to ventilation, it, it's, it's something that is unavoidable. I think intubation is dangerous because they are obviously acidotic, they're hypoxic, there's significant airway obstruction. Things that you should be doing, you should be using a cuffed endotracheal tube because you can anticipate you're going to be needing high pressure ventilation. You need a nasogastric tube to deflate the stomach. Um, if you're choosing an anesthetic agent, ketamine is a great anesthetic agent because it could ease a bronchodilator. Um, you're wanting a muscle relaxant that works quickly like scoline or rocuronium. If you have a friendly anesthetist handy, you could gas induce um, anesthesia and bronchodilate the child that way as well. I think it's important to make sure that there's no pneumothorax and make sure that the tube is in the right spot. And when you're ventilating asthmatics, I mean, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to reduce their work of breathing. We're trying to overcome the airway obstruction. We're wanting to oxygenate them adequately. I'm not going to aim for 100. I'm going to aim for probably low 90s, high 80s. I'm not going to aim for normal CO2s. I'm going to allow them to, be, to, to be permissive on my CO2s. And importantly, I don't want to cause damage. Um, I don't want to pop a pneumothorax. I don't want to over distend alveoli. And I need to be mindful of a, a child that's probably on steroids. If we're using muscle relaxants, we don't want to be inducing any myopathies. And at the same time as ventilating the child, we need to be keeping them comfortable on the ventilator and safe. So if we're just looking at monitoring, you're looking at monitoring heart rate, saturations, Entitled CO trace, CO2 traces, you can see with this one with this upslay slanting trace that there is still significant airway obstruction. Uh, if you're using high pressures to ventilate children, be wary that if you suddenly, these children might be a bit hypovolemic if they haven't been eating and drinking. If you're using high intrathoracic pressures, you could actually be uh, impeding venous return to the heart and making them, hypo, making them hypotensive. It's possible to sorry, measure. Sorry, Dr. Sally, sorry, just you have 10 more minutes. 10 sorry. more minutes, thank you. <laughs> it's possible to measure the intrinsic PEEP um, by doing a expiratory breath hold. And you're trying to see what your set PEEP is. If you're doing an expiratory hold there, you can, as the, as the pressures equilibrate, your total PEEP is measured and then you subtract your your extrinsic PEEP. And it's useful, we, we've used it to sort of adjust PEEP on the ventilators to not over distend lungs uh, and to hopefully improve um, airway, and to prevent airway obstruction. So this is, a, this is from a patient that we ventilated a few years back and you can see with PEEP pressures of 39, you know, I, my heart stops when I see that high pressures, but if we look at the tidal volume that that's delivered, it's actually quite small. And a lot of that high pressure is used to overcome the airway resistance. We, we tend to use some PEEP to try and stent airways open. There are some people that absolutely believe you should be using no PEEP or very little PEEP. So this is um, bone of contention. 
you're trying to, to give children short, slow respiratory rates. In, if we're looking at inspiration, you're wanting to give them enough time to exhale, so you need to give them a long expiratory time to prevent breath stacking. This is just to demonstrate permissive hypercapnia, once again, kilopascals. We have a normal pH in the body able to compensate and cope with that. We tend to not use nebulizers when children are on ventilators. If they so tight and have such severe bronch bronchospasm, we tend to use IV cell butamol or IV bronchodilators in preference. Uh, be wary that if you're using NEBs via the circuits, your expiratory, um, your expiratory filters can block up an increasing airways resistance. It's useful looking at this paper by Christopher Newth, looking at asthma treatments in, um, in the state in different settings and looking at how, at how diverse treatments are. Uh, maybe I can just say this is sort of from early 2000s and about 2000, late 2005, I think to 2008. At that point, only about 17% of, of units were using non-invasive type ventilation. Is there an ideal mode of ventilation? No, it's the short answer. We tend to use either pressure control or pressure regulated volume control. And there's some theories that the decelerating gas flows that you get with pressure control allows better ventilation in, in asthmatics. In terms of treatment, variation in children getting nebulizers, um, IV, bronch IV beta agonists, um, between 30%, 48% of them, not, uh, I mean, aminophilin is, is a drug that we would use in ICU if probably before we intubate to see if we can um, open, open up the, the bronchi, uh, but not used widely. And then Heliox, um, some places used it, some people don't, we don't have access to it, but um, the improvement, and it's one of it's an expensive therapy that might or might not help. Magnesium sulfate has fairly become regular in children with severe asthma, but still quite a lot of variation between different units. In children, in terms of length of ventilation, most of them were ventilated for about three days. And interestingly enough, children that were intubated outside of the, of the ICU had a shorter mean of ventilation, mean, shorter time of ventilation, 25 hours versus 84. So probably these children had less severe illness um, and they were intubated. I'm going to skip this one because it shows pretty much the same thing in Europe and maybe just to talk about outcomes of asthma. And this is also, this is by Trevor Duke who reviewed um, children that had, had been admitted to an intensive care unit over about a 15 year period that were followed up to 10 years post ICU admission. And about two thirds of children admitted to ICU with severe life-threatening asthma were readmitted um, to hospital and 17% of them had a second ICU admission. Half of them had persistent asthma. You know, children with asthma shouldn't die, uh, but inevitably, depending on where you work, uh, there is going to be some, some mortality. Um, if I leave you with some final thoughts is that um, therapies for children in, in ICUs, there, there's a wide variety of, of treatments and there isn't a standard um, treatment algorithm for intensive care with many people, different units having different treatment approaches. There's a growing body of evidence that's supporting the use of non-invasive ventilation in managing severe inspiratory and expiratory airway obstruction. And mechanical ventilation of a child with asthma is incredibly challenging. Thank you, and I leave you with a picture of Heart Bay from Chapman's Peak. This water is freezing cold, but it's incredibly beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sally, for your amazing lecture and for the amazing pictures that you shared with us. Hopefully we can join you there one day, or you could join us here in Iran again. We can't Inshallah. wait to meet you in person. Inshallah. <laughs> okay, so because we don't have more time, I'm going to skip uh, a few of our points. So uh, thank you, Dr. Sely, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mohseni. Thank you, Professor Cox. Thank you all of our audiences for joining us today. 
don't forget that we have another ICU session tomorrow and, don't, and uh, join us. And also after this session, we're going to have a, a, our next panel about nephrology and we would really appreciate it. And I think you would enjoy it. If you can, you can still stay with us and jo join in that. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sally, Dr. Mohsenibu. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.